From WFIU in Bloomington, Indiana, I'm Kate Young, and this is Earth Eats. Our society has gotten so far disconnected from where their food comes from, that if we can begin with the students, start with children teaching them how to grow food, they will be much more interested in where their food comes from as they get older. And I think I think that's a very important part of the process. This week on the show, it's back to school with Kendall Slaughter. He's the farm to school coordinator for Springfield Public Schools in Southern Missouri. We'll tour an elementary school designed as a sundial, meet the bunnies and the chickens, and hear about how the school system is building a sustainable school garden program and moving towards local food sourcing in school lunches. That's coming right up. Stay with us. Thanks for listening to Earth Eats. I'm Kate Young. You may already know this about me, but in my mind, when it comes to gardens and schools, it's a no-brainer. The benefits are obvious from the elementary level on up through high school. There is so much to be learned from working in a garden, growing food. There's biology lessons about plants and soil and insects. You can study the science of weather, work on timing certain plants for the right season, space planning, math, You can learn about economics and running a business by calculating garden inputs and production. There's nutrition lessons and so much more. And this is hands-on project-based learning that tends to stick in our brains much more than book learning. But perhaps more important are the less measurable benefits of having gardens in schools. They provide opportunities to be outside more, to interact with nature, to work with our hands, to work cooperatively towards shared goals, to face uncertainty, and to learn from failure. Gardens can serve as safe spaces for some students, maybe a place to calm down that's away from the classroom and is a space of nourishment rather than punishment. And they provide chances for students to taste a vine-ripened tomato or a crisp winter carrot straight from the ground, maybe for the first time. A garden at school provides a chance to make first-hand connections between farm and fork, and to understand where our food comes from. For our guest today, this might be the most important part. My name is Kendall Slaughter, and I'm the Farm to School Coordinator for Springfield Public Schools. For many years now, I've been longing for a farm to school program in our public school system and wishing we had a district-wide garden coordinator to support school gardens. So when I heard this was happening in the town where I spent some of my school years, I wanted to learn more. I met with Kendall at the Ag Academy in Springfield, Missouri. The Ag Academy is sort of a magnet school within the choice programs at Springfield Public Schools, and they teach Missouri learning standards through the lens of agriculture. Here's Kendall. So this big main room is what we call our APR, our all-purpose room. We do pick up and drop off from this room. We do any kind of assemblies. We do lunch. We do indoor recess. Anything that requires a large space will all be in, in this, in the APR. So you'll notice looking out into the courtyard, the building's kind of, it's, it's round in the shape of a sundial intentionally. So as we walk around the building, I'll explain that just a little bit more, but the students are able to, to cut across, as you can see the kids running through the courtyard right now. They kind of cut through the courtyard in an attempt to circumvent the long hallway. And then we allow the rabbits, we have two rabbits that we allow to run around in our courtyard daily and two guinea pigs so the kids bring them out when they get here in the morning they let them run around all day they make monitor them make sure they have water and food if need be watch the weather of course we're going to get some bad weather this afternoon so they'll probably pull them in a little bit early and then they they spend the nights in the classroom so we'll show you the hutch that the rabbits stay into as we as we walk around that's so cool This is a school that's a part of the choice program. So any student within the Springfield Public Schools has the opportunity to apply to be a part of the choice programs. That includes 
AFBA AOE, which is our Academy of Exploration and our Academy of Fine and Performing Arts, mm -hmm. as well as our Health Sciences Academy that's at Mercy Hospital. So students of the appropriate age can apply to be a part of our lottery system, and then we run it through a program that randomly selects students so that we aren't playing any kind of favorites to right. any, any students in the district. So if they get drawn for fourth grade, they have the choice to stay for fifth and sixth if they'd like to. And we add some students as they may potentially move or drop out of the program. So you, we may have students that get added in fifth grade or in sixth grade potentially, and they have that choice to, to move up. So after sixth grade, they'll go to their regular middle school that's a part of their feeder. So this is the Ag Academy. So everything that we do here is, is generally centered around agriculture. So many of our math lessons, our English lessons, ha and, and even our art classes have, have to do with agriculture in some way. I'll make through here. I'll show you our kitchens. We just walked into our student kitchen. So we have two kitchens on site, one that's designed for teaching and one that's designed for the students having the opportunity to use it themselves. So the kitchen we're standing in right now is the student kitchen. And if you want to follow me through here, we will go into what we call the demonstration kitchen. So we have risers set up and we have a center island for teachers to be able to teach a new recipe to the students. And then they're able to go into the student kitchen and give it a try themselves. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really cool. And we've done all kinds of different cooking competitions in here. So we'll break the kids into different groups and they'll do cooking competitions based on pizza, cookies, crepes. We made every possible way you can make eggs. So we've done all different types of competitions. And then the staff in the building are the judges. So we have papers that we write down our notes on. And a part of the competition is that they have to add a healthy ingredient to the recipe that wasn't in the original recipe. So we judge them based on that and based on flavor and everything like that. So one day we spent an entire day from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. just tasting pizza all day long. So we, were, we staff got pretty tired of it by the end of the day. <laughs> but it's really fun and interesting to, to see what they kind of come up with. They learned how to make hummus. And the eggs came from, we took a field trip to Vital Farms, which is an egg processor here in Springfield, where they process 6 million eggs a day. So we took all the students on a field trip to see that whole process, and then they donated close to 400 eggs to our program. So then the students have the opportunity to experiment with all the different types of ways to make eggs. Wow. <laughs> but you said you have chickens here. We do, yes. They, the students hatched out chickens this year. So they're, they're not laying just yet. They're not yet. laying hens yet. Okay. Yes, exactly. But we have, uh, they hatched out 17 chickens. They're all straight run, so we don't know exactly what we're going to get with them all. But we just this week transitioned them to our outdoor coop. So they were in a brooder in the classrooms, and we were bringing them into the courtyard, letting them run around during the day like we do with the rabbits. But they're big enough now that we've transitioned them to the chicken coop outside. You want to take a look in the classrooms? <laughs> so th this is one of the two fourth grade classrooms and you'll notice there's a garage door that opens and closes between the two so they have the opportunity to co-teach or oh. teach separately depending upon the time of the day. And you'll notice there's a tower garden in each of our classrooms so each teacher manages their own tower garden which is an aeroponic growing system. We mostly use to grow lettuce, leafy greens, and herbs. And the students will harvest that, and then they will clean it, and then they serve it to the other students for lunch, generally. Nice. Some, we've also offered, we've sold some of our lettuce to some of the, the parents in Carline. We have also given it away to parents in the car line. What um, do you mean by car line? Just coming to pick up their kids? Yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. When they come and pick up kids, we'll have a sign out there that says, hey, we harvested lettuce today. If you want some, let us know and we'll bring some out to you. And then the kids Let us know. All right, exactly, exactly. We, we also have one, one of our towers. They grow primarily for food for, the, for our livestock. So we have, two, like I said, two guinea pigs, two rabbits, and a bearded dragon. So they grow green specifically specifically for them as well. Oh, that must feel so great for them to know that they're growing something for the animals that they love. <laughs> yes, exactly. So we're looking into the fifth grade classroom and you'll notice they're all kind of set up the same. You'll also notice each of the classrooms has a different colored accent wall. 
okay? So the four colors represent the four seasons. Orange is gonna be fall, yellow is gonna be summer, green is gonna be spring, and blue is gonna be winter. So like I mentioned, the, the building is in the shape of a sundial. So the intent for those colors for those rooms are that those rooms will capture light during those particular seasons. So you'll, you'll notice this is our rabbit hutch. The students wheel that in and out of the classroom each day and allow the rabbits to run around. You can see one of the rabbits. It's I was going to say, where, how do you, oh, there it is. Oh. I'm not sure where the other one is, but there should be two of them out there running around. And the guinea pigs are going to be in this uh, enclosure here which we didn't know until after we got guinea pigs that they are technically an FFA show animal. They also did research and found out that guinea pigs are not supposed to be solo. You should have, you should have a companion for them. So after we were gifted the first one, the teacher decided she needed to go out and buy another one. So now we have two guinea pigs, and their names are Rodney, of course, from Dr. Doolittle, and the other one the students named Dwayne the Guinea Pig Johnson. <laughs> So you'll notice all the house plants around the building as well. The students maintain all the house plants in the building except for the ones that are a little bit too high. But you can take a look at, at some of these art projects. We approached a wall with a line of small trifold presentations. There are projects on the Carolina Reaper pepper, soybeans, apple trees, pumpkins, corn. So they do all kinds of research, where it grows, we have nutrition facts, what you can use them for, how long it takes to get to harvest all kinds of stuff that the students were required to do research for and then made this art project. What I love too is that it's just made with a file folder. So you don't right. have to get the big old giant, you know, exactly. thing that you're wielding around and you never know where to put it when you're done. This is like they can just put it in with their other schoolwork. Exactly. <laughs> and yet it really works as a as a trifold. It's beautiful. It looks nice, doesn't it? It looks and we really have some good. Really, really amazing artists here too. Yes, you definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're looking right now out at the chicken coop. The students are checking the food and the water, making sure that they have everything that they need to make it through another day. And they have the garden shed right next to the chicken coop. And if you take a look out here, you can see our, our garden over there as well. We don't have a whole lot in it just yet for the year. We have a couple of things planted out there, but the students built those raised beds with the wood and the cornerstone pavers. The students helped mulch the area and they do all the planting and assist in watering as well. And once we have something to harvest, they will be doing the harvesting too. And, and we have a long-term plan of hopefully getting goats someday as well. So we're, we're wanting to expand our, all of our agriculture practices. On Arbor Day, we're going to be planting our first fruit trees. So we're beginning our orchard on Arbor Day this year. So is this a fairly new facility? Like it seems like it. Yes, this is the first year. Yep, we, we oh, opened. Okay. Yep, we had Sorry. summer, that's okay. We, we had summer school here this year. And so we had students start in June and those were the earliest students we had here. And then uh, this is the first full year that we've had here. So this, this is the, the sixth grade classrooms. So you'll notice one of them's green. One of them's blue, to, with the intent to capture light in, in the different rooms at the different times of the year. You also notice the ceilings getting taller as we go around. That is intentional for the, the building and the, student, and, and the ceilings to grow with the students as they get older. So they start in fourth grade with the lowest ceiling and end with the highest ceiling towards sixth grade. That's awesome. <laughs> I love all these architectural metaphors. <laughs> oh yes, and, and all the, the rock that's on the outside of the building was intentionally selected by the designer of the building because it reminded him of his father's farm, of which his father is, is Bill Dar, his foundation donated the money for this building as well as the money for my farm to school program. So everything that I do is all entirely funded by a private grant currently. This is the science lab, which currently hasn't been used that much for science, but our sixth graders are required to have a laboratory setting. So our sixth graders will certainly use it, but we have also used it for technology class, for music class, for art class, for a number of different classes we've used this space. And you can see the 3D printers even working as we're talking back there. So. Oh, I see that. Yeah, so our, our students have different jobs throughout the days. So we have some students that care for the rabbits. There's some students that care for the chickens. There's some students that care for the greenhouse. There's some students that help clean up generally each morning. And there's one student, I believe, that's 
generally in charge of making sure that that 3D printer is running all the time. So they almost always have something printing, and it could be little tchotchkes that they give away for good behavior in the school, or I'm in the process of talking to our IT teacher to get him to make some plant tags for us for our garden so we can have custom Ag Academy plant tags that we'll go out in our garden. So that's our, that's our science lab here. And next we will work our way into our greenhouse. That's Kendall Slaughter, Farm to School Coordinator for the Springfield Public School District in Southern Missouri. We're on a tour of the Ag Academy, and after a short break, we'll head into the greenhouse to see what's growing and to hear about how the young students learn to care for the different plants. Stay with us. Kate Young here. This is Earth Eats. My guest is Kendall Slaughter, the farm to school coordinator for an entire school district in southern Missouri. We're on a tour of the Ag Academy, one of their magnet schools with a focus on food and farming. We are now entering the on site greenhouse. Oh, it's right here. Yes. So oh. our greenhouse is very close, very accessible. I apologize, it's a little bit dirty on the floor but it's a working greenhouse. So you'll notice all of the seedling trays started down there. Those are all gonna be a part of our plant sale. We have all the herbs, we have several different types of tomatoes, different types of peppers, lemongrass, all kinds of really interesting and fun yeah, crops herbs, for us to grow. Yeah. We have double flower datura and we have echinacea and we're hopefully gonna be selling some pawpaws and persimmons, all kinds of weird different stuff we've got going on in here. And, and the students have, start, have started the majority of the plants we have here. And you notice we have two fabric raised beds that we have planted in here. And we don't have them on anymore, but over the winter we have these grow lights set up so that we can be growing a crop all the way through the winter. So we have perfect climate conditions in here, maintained with the heater and fans and a vent fan. We have our irrigation set up to maintain our seedlings and we have a whole bunch of grow lights set up to extend our growing season and just give them a little bit more light to get, jump start them in the spring or continue them in the fall. I see you looking down at our plant tags and we have uh, a number of different colored plant tags. So if you, if you walk with me down here, you'll notice on our door, we have our Ag Academy watering guide by color. So we have different colored plant tags. Generally at this point, it's for the house plants that are that are in the in the building because right now everything's using quite a bit more water so we're most watering most everything daily in the greenhouse so you'll see green is for every day blue is monday wednesday friday yellow's th tuesday thursday and red is monday only which is generally plants that aren't using nearly as much water like succulents or some of our house plants I love it. It's just like you've set up all the systems to make this doable for them and to teach them what it's like to work in in a professional setting because like all of this irrigation and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, we're, we're trying to do it as professionally as possible while including the kids. And so we use, we use high quality potting mix. And uh, you'll, you'll notice several of our crops that are in these raised beds are even pretty close to harvest. We have a cucumber okay, here. Look, oh my gosh. That, that's probably four inches long, three, four inches long. We have broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, calendula, marigolds, radishes, all kinds of different things planted in these raised beds. And they seem to be doing pretty well. So we're, we've been pretty happy with it so far. But the students come in daily. They, they water daily. And during this time of the year, they're, they're watering even twice a day sometimes for some of the seedlings that we're trying to get going for our, our plant sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I see they've got some potatoes, sweet potato slips started too. Yes, that's exactly right. And they, they just started producing maybe a week ago. And so some of this stuff will get planted out in your garden, but most of it is for the plant sale? Correct, yeah. A, a lot of it will get planted out in our gardens, but we have, two, we have nine raised bed gardens currently, hopefully, hoping to expand in the future, but we probably have three or 400 tomato plants started. So that's quite a bit more than we're actually gonna need here. So we'll pull, we'll pull 
whatever plants the students really want to plant out there, we'll give them the option to plant. And then whatever's left will get sold at the plant sale. So we'll probably end up, if I had to guess, maybe end up selling some of the succulents as well. All of these pots down here, these are all seeded with pawpaws. We did a pawpaw tasting last fall. So all of the students that, that wanted to, I think we only had one decline to taste it. So all 100 students had the opportunity to taste pawpaw in the fall. They saved 289 seeds from that and we had the students start all these seeds. And I'm just now, as we're talking about, noticing the first signs of life that I hadn't noticed yet. So they, they seeded these in February and we are just now starting to see a couple of them emerge from the ground. So they're very, very slow to grow. My understanding is that pawpaws and persimmons need that like cold temps or something. Correct, exactly. So we, we did our taste test in October. The students saved all those seeds. We put those seeds with some moist potting mix in a Ziploc bag and put it in the refrigerator. And we set a date on it for February 1st, pull it out. We pulled them out and started them then. So we did simulate a, a right. winter by giving giving them that cold stratification that they that they require. And now they're starting. There are that's a couple really of them. That's exciting. Very exciting. Because I was honestly a little bit nervous that a few of them had gotten too dry. Uh -huh. But but we certainly have some that are growing. So that's very oh, exciting. I see another one there too. Excellent. Even if you just get a few, it's going to be exciting. Exactly. And you'll you'll notice they don't really have any plant labels. Everything else has a ton of plant labels and what the students have started they generally like to put their names on their plants and they want to know which ones are theirs we intentionally did not do that with these pawpaws and the reason is we don't know exactly what we're going to do with them yet don't know if we're going to try and sell them don't know if we're going to plant a few of them here don't know if we're going to give them away send them home with students and pawpaws naturally have about a 50 or 60 percent germination rate so you didn't want anyone to feel bad. Exactly, exactly. I didn't want to discourage anybody by them thinking that they didn't do something right when I was here and watched them and all of them planted it just right. So uh, we only expect to get maybe about a hundred of them to actually grow. So I didn't want anybody to be discouraged. Yeah, that's a really smart way to do it is just to <laughs> let them know ahead of time, this isn't going to be a failure if half of them don't grow. That's exactly. going to be a success. Right, and, and my personal motto is, uh, is that there aren't failures in gardening, just experiences, yep. just learning opportunities, yeah. right? So even if they don't grow, and that's what I try to reiterate to a lot of the kids, that you know we may plant it out and we may have vandalism. Somebody might come through and rip our plants out and that's nothing, we can't do anything about that, you know? nothing we can do to prevent that sometimes things just happen sometimes we have a bad storm and hail destroys our peaches you know so it just kind of yes you can't control <laughs> everything so yeah it's it's all an experiment and it's all an opportunity to learn yeah. so would you like to walk out and see the chicken coop closer or sure. it sounded like it might was getting ready to start raining <laughs> but maybe we can avoid that it's not raining yet excellent We'll walk by the rabbit hutch so you can get a okay, better, better cool. eye of it. We peeked into the handsome rabbit hutch and saw one of the rabbits nestled inside. Gorgeous. One of our, our fourth grade teachers, Sarah Ward, built it and with her husband. The other one is a little bit more adventurous. We let him just kind of run around the school occasionally, and she we will find her all the way down the hall. They try to keep her in the classroom, and if nobody's paying attention, she'll jump out of the, out of the room and run all the way down the hallway and has made it almost all the way to the front desk before anybody realized where she was. <laughs> I was going to ask how you said that they'll go round up the rabbits before it's time to leave. They're usually around here and easy to find? Or? Oh, yes, yeah. The, the courtyard is, is fenced in, so they can't get out. Okay. So, so they're stuck in here. Okay. So usually it'll take a couple of them to kind of corner, up, corner the, the rabbits before they're able to actually get them. So we, we'll go out this door okay. here. So we talked about the, the tower gardens a little bit. We, we currently have 40 of them in our district across early child care all the way through high school and our alternative center. So the farm to school program has a presence at the majority of schools in Springfield Public Schools. We're gonna go around this way. But so we have about 26 in-ground gardens. We have five unheated high tunnels four heated greenhouses that are currently in use. And then, like I said, we have 40 tower gardens district-wide. Okay. 
And the majority of what's grown in the tower gardens is used either in the classroom or gets sent home with, with students. And same with the produce that comes out of the gardens, usually goes home with students. Sometimes there's enough to donate and occasionally they've had enough to be able to sell. So right here on our right is our garden beds. The, our irrigation is under construction right now. We had some vandalism last spring and it, they kind of destroyed some of our irrigation. So we're in the process of redoing the irrigation. So it kind of looks like a mess, but you could see we have little radishes coming up. Uh, we have onions that have been planted. Why, those three beds in the back are for wildflowers. So we have uh, pollinator opportunities as well. Peas on that far end, potatoes on, on these really large raised beds. Following the vandalism, we decided to put up this fence. We also have a pretty healthy coyote population around here. Uh. Um, so I came in one morning about 6.30 and saw two coyote pups running out of the garden carrying some of my irrigation. Weird. <laughs> right? Uh, I, I'm guessing they were just playing around, but I don't know. Didn't know what it was. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we have 17 chickens. If I'm being honest, I'm not sure what breed they are. We can we can ask the, the teachers. They're quiet. They, they are very quiet right now, aren't they? <laughs> but the, the, the students have really enjoyed watching them hatch and, and helping raise them, them from chicks. So they just today completed their, they broke into groups of four and we're all making a documentary style inform, informative video about different processes of raising chicks. So some of them spoke about candling, some of them spoke about the actual hatching process, how to create a brooder, things like that, what, what types of feed to use. So they've all created different documentary style videos that will be presented. Well, so their coop something. looks very well cared for. They look like very happy animals. <laughs> <laughs> we hope that they are and hope they continue to be happy. But yeah. uh, like I said, we have room to expand back here. We're going to be planting our fruit tree orchard soon, maybe expanding our gardens. We've talked about a high tunnel potentially back here. We're also working currently with MSU to put a high tunnel in front of the school oh. that we will partially manage and MSU will partially manage. So we'll use some of that space. But if we get to a point where we're really growing a whole lot of produce and we might need to expand, we have room to put a high tunnel in back here as well. Okay. I like how the classrooms look out onto this though, so they can kind of... Oh yeah. Keep the chickens in mind. Exactly. Keep an eye on it all the time. And, uh, and they've got these hummingbird feeders. Exactly. Much of the landscaping is done with either natives or edible crops. So you'll notice in the, in the front, we have a row of strawberries right in front and in the back is elderberries. So we, we have edible crops as well. And then the students planted tulips around a bunch of the trees. We had tulips donated from Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company and as well as the majority of our seed. I, I, we house the, the seed bank for the school district here. And I guess I didn't show that to you, but we house the seed bank here and Baker Creek has donated massive amounts of seed to the farm to school program. If I had to guess, probably 30,000 packets, something oh, like wow. that. So they have been very generous. Getting set up for lunch now. And this is, this is part of the reward system that they have set up and that they give out what they call choice tickets. Choice is an acronym and each, each letter stands for a, a quality that they exhibit. So when they exhibit that quality, they're given a choice ticket and they collect those choice tickets and they're able to exchange them for whatever's on this cart. Some of them are some of the 3D printed things, a bug habitat, a bug net. There's looks mm -hmm. like there's slime. There's all kinds of, of cool. interesting. They stand for Caring, honor, openness, integrity, collaboration, and effort. That's what choice nice. stands for. Okay. Yeah, so based on based on those, they receive tickets and they can exchange those tickets for fun little tchotchkes and stuff. Yeah. At this point, the principal walked through the all purpose room and Kendall introduced us. Yeah, so she's She's the principal over all of the choice programs, so she travels in between all the schools. Oh, I also didn't mention the our wolf program, which is out of the Bass Pro Shop. It's all entirely outdoors centered, so the students there learn about wild edibles, and they have the opportunity to hunt and learn how to clean their own animals. They go fishing, anything outdoors, they're all about that. Yeah. So it's kind of like a wildlife thing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, that's pretty much the whole building here. Seems like a good time for a quick break. When we come back, I'll sit down with Kendall to learn about his role as the school garden coordinator for all of the schools in the district. Stay with us. This is Earth Eats, I'm Kate Young, and we're talking with Kendall Slaughter, the farm to school coordinator for the Springfield Public Schools in Missouri. After our tour of the new Ag Academy for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, I asked Kendall to tell me more about his role in the larger school district. My office is housed here, but I work district-wide. Okay. So I work at all of the schools in, in the district that have any kind of gardening, farming, local food-related activities. I'm, I'm happy to help promote what they have going on or give them any kind of advice or, or help in any way. So, so how does the school garden program work? Is it integrated into the school academics or is it usually an after school program or is it just vary from school to school? It definitely varies from school to school. Many teachers will utilize a school garden as a part of their curriculum. Many teachers will use the school garden as just kind of a safe space for for students if they need a minute to kind of calm down. Holland Elementary is really good about that, that if they have a student that's having a behavior, they're able to go out into the courtyard, kind of collect their thoughts, calm down a little bit. They have different kind of stations there that they can have things they can do but it really varies depending upon which site central high school has a really active garden club they meet twice a week for an hour and a half and over the summer they meet twice a week for four hours so and it's and it's but it's not it's after school the club is correct yes the club is after school so it it really varies depending upon the teacher that's kind of in charge of that garden which in our district we call them garden champions so my job is to give the garden champions what they need to make their garden successful i'm happy to come in and work with their students work with them provide them with any kind of support that they need to make it successful are there resources available for material supplies if, if they're needed and that sort of thing? Yes, I, I have a relatively small budget to work with for the entire district. But like I said earlier, my, the, my entire program is funded by a private foundation grant. So right now the district isn't paying for me to be here, but I'm hopeful that they will in the near future. The grant money runs out in about May of 2025. Okay. So we've the team that I've been working with have been working really hard to get farm to school on our salary schedule so that the district will start to budget for my program once once the grant money runs out. And we've successfully done that. So we are now officially on the salary schedule, and I've been told that that's not a small feat, so I should be pretty proud of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the reasons I was so interested in talking to you is that I've it, in, in our community, we have tried to kind of get some kind of garden farm to school program or some kind of garden program in the school district because what we've noticed is the schools that do have garden programs, it's usually dependent on a few super enthusiastic parents. And then once their kids leave the school, then they leave the garden and the garden's not there anymore. Or maybe there's a teacher or two who's really into it, but they get kind of burnt out because they've got all this other stuff they have to do. And so it just feels like it's really hard to sustain it Mm -hmm. unless the district puts some kind of energy into it, some kind of resource. And a garden coordinator seems like Right, absolutely. I think I think some kind of garden coordinator is essential to make it work if we're talking about a district wide level, right? So a good place to start our district started with a USDA farm to school grant. So that kind of got everybody's interest going. And then we received this grant, but I'm hopeful that uh, that our district and our new superintendent will see the impact that the farm to school program is having district wide. I've gotten a, a, a lot of very good feedback and become much more busy in the last couple months. <laughs> now that people are kind of learning that I'm here and I can provide them the support that they need when they need it, we have a lot more people interested in continuing. Before they thought they didn't have a lot of support because of what you just said, right? They probably don't, depending on which school it is. But there's also a lot of really good funding streams out there to help get it going. There's all kinds of grants that can be applied for. And you can also ask 
local businesses to help support. We've gotten massive donations, like I said, from Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. We have gotten donations from Lowe's and from Home Depot. So yeah, there's there's many different ways the school gardens are are managed and funded and trying to get it started is the biggest part. Once you get it started, it starts rolling really quickly. To me, it just seems like even that is not enough like right. <laughs> like when you if you really wanted a program in every school for instance right. or in every say it was every high school or say sure. it was every middle school or something just having it where it's maintained enough that the different teachers could use it if they wanted sure. without necessarily having to get out there and do all of it sure you know and just that it's really like the the things that i've noticed were that some of the barriers weren't just the materials mm -hmm or the seeds or you know whatever it's really the time yes it's yeah. the time and the dedication and time plus know-how like knowing how to maintain it right. and what is needed and setting up work days or setting up all that stuff exactly and so part of not knowing exactly what to do i can help support that i write a monthly newsletter for all of our garden champions in the district and i say hey this month you should think about planting this don't plant this yet it's too early or, or you know what I'm saying? Or if you do plant this out, be ready to cover it if, it if we get a frost. Make sure these plants need this much water for this amount of time. Things like that. We're having a training this Saturday. Make sure you come to the training if you want to learn more about working in the garden with your students. Things like that. So That is perfect. Yeah, just having one person who kind of has their eye on what's going on and is communicating. Right, and the more people involved, the better. So the more support we have at an individual school site, the better that school garden looks. Mm -hmm. So our, our best looking school garden in the district currently has two garden champions at the school that are there two times a week, every week, that they can rely upon each other so that if one can't be there, the other will make sure that they are to continue, mm -hmm. right? So, And we, the fact that you, they, they keep that up over the summer is amazing. Exactly. And I, th I think that's a big part of why their garden looks so good is because they're using a garden club and rather than using it as a part of their curriculum. Some of our teachers don't have a garden club, but use it as a part of their curriculum. So some of the students in their class have no desire to be in the garden. So they see it as a chore. They have to get out and go into the garden. So they're definitely not gonna support the garden over the summer, right? right? So, but by having a garden club, you get those kids that really wanna be in the garden, right? right? So they're the ones that are willing to make the effort to be there twice a week, every week, all the way through the summer and really make their garden a showcase piece for the district and and they've done a good job doing that that is amazing i love that and it's that is one of the other inherent problems of the school garden is that there's the summer yes and the summer is when it needs the most water when it needs the most kind of tending right exactly and that's that's why we have invested so much into these tower gardens as well because those can be in a classroom you don't have to leave the classroom. The students still get the opportunity to interact with plants. They still get the science behind how to grow a plant. They have to mix the nutrients that go into the base that feeds the plants. They have to make sure it's filled with water to make sure the light timer is set correctly. And then, and then harvest and what to do with the harvest after that. So we've, like I said, we have 40 of those tower gardens in the district. And every year we're buying more. And every year we have more and more teachers interested in using one of those tower gardens. And not, not even necessarily regular classroom teachers. I'm getting receptionists asking for one for the front office. I'm getting librarians asking for ones for their library. I'm getting cafeteria workers asking for some for their cafeteria. I'm absolutely in support of all of those. Let's buy, let's have everybody have a garden, you know? So the more people we can have involved, the more successful the garden will be. We generally encourage more than one teacher to be present in the garden, but we can't always expect that at, at each site. Sure. So the, the better funded schools generally will have better support financially and otherwise. So it, it really kind of varies. The, the support in the district really varies quite a bit depending upon which school site we're at. Yeah. So if you could, if you could have exactly what you wanted like just your dream mm -hmm. for for the district and gardening what would you what would you want well first would be more employees <laughs> right it's it's becoming challenging for me to be able to keep up with everything that i need to get done so more empl employees would be number one i also have a vision of starting what i'm calling sps farms 
because part of my job is to help procure local produce as well that goes into the cafeterias. But there aren't any producers in our area that are growing to a scale that will significantly impact our, our buying of produce. We use a nutrition services management company, and through that com management company, they, it, I, I recently learned it's not a requirement, but they strongly encourage farmers to be GAP certified, which is good agricultural practices through the USDA. And believe it or not, rural Missouri farmers aren't interested in inviting the federal government onto their property to tell them what they're doing right and wrong. <laughs> so, so there aren't many uh, GAP certified farms in Missouri in general. So we don't have a whole lot of options of people to buy from. Springfield Public Schools is one of the largest property owners in the city of Springfield. A lot of that property is maintained by a mower. So if instead of mowing those green spaces, we used some of that space to create really large gardens and funnel all that produce that's grown directly into our cafeterias, the cost that we're going to have is going to be almost is going to be negligible. It's going to be the cost that we would have would end up being just salaries. Yeah. We would we would be able to get seed donated to our program. We can get wood chips and compost donated and delivered. All all we need to pay for is transportation of the produce and the labor, and the labor to do it. And and water, we would need to pay for water, of course. But maybe cold storage, but yeah, yeah, cold storage. But a, a lot of our schools have cold yeah. storage. So if we can get all that produce to individual schools, so we have somebody that's transporting the produce and a couple people that are maintaining that garden. That's my big vision: is creating an SPS farms. And that would also be another kind of laboratory for this school oh, for absolutely. the other schools to come visit and see like here's a working farm absolutely. at a little bit larger scale than your school garden a absolutely yeah it would it would be open to any students in the district to come in and see how it's done they can come and help they can volunteer we could even host uh, other schools yeah. coming to ours for professional development opportunities they can learn from us how the right way to do it for their school is right. how they can grow a large amount of produce that goes directly into their cafeteria yeah. And you could run things like volunteer days and stuff, because I think people really get a lot of enjoyment out of being in a garden when they don't have one in their own uh, oh, yard absolutely. or whatever, just to be like, yeah, we go out once every two weeks and we help in this garden. Right. And even more to that, if they're benefiting children, even more people are interested in that. That's right. True. And if the children are out there working in the garden with them and learning with them, even more interest in that. Right. So I, th I think the opportunity is there. I just need to get myself in front of the right person that believes in my vision <laughs> and willing to help me invest in that. Yep. And you're right, it's staffing. That would be the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't been able to purchase much produce for the district. We do a couple of taste tests that come from local farmers, but we are also serving local beef in all of our high schools. All of our high schools utilize local ground beef for all of their tacos, sloppy joes, anything that is ground beef is is local at the high schools we do still buy frozen burger patties um, that are not local but all of the rest of the beef is local so we have had made baby steps in the right direction <laughs> we go through show me beef and it, and that is a co-op of many smaller local farmers and they all come together and we buy from show me beef okay. right so it's it's not big factory farms yeah. it's it's a small co-op a long time coming, uh, you know, a, a lot of conversations have been had, and I certainly did not do that alone. It was very much our nutrition services department that has helped out massively with making that happen. Yeah, if you have them on board, if they're interested too, that's that's what you need. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and they are on board. What we have to find is the right price point for the, for the right amount of produce, and th that's our biggest hang-up. Being the largest school district in the state of Missouri, we serve about 25,000 meals a day, so grandpa's 10 quarts of tomatoes is not going to make an impact on her. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would like to, to buy that, but if we were to start buying from many smaller local farms, we would need at least one person full-time coordinating all of those purchases from so many different places. Yeah, but um, that, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> and I also know just from experience that like one, one time I was involved in a school garden and we didn't grow a lot, but at one point there was like a bumper crop of cherry tomatoes and they were able to put them in the salad bar. Oh, yeah. And the pride that they felt of like, 
our tomatoes are in the salad bar. Like they just felt like they were really contributing. Absolutely. We've we've had bumper crops of sweet potatoes, of lettuce. We've put some of our SPS cilantro onto our taco bars. Nice. You know, like we like we said earlier with the tower gardens, the students here at the Ag Academy plant the tower gardens, they maintain the tower gardens, they harvest the tower gardens, they clean the lettuce, they serve the lettuce to the other students in. So they are entirely doing the process. Well, there'll, there'll be a teacher there making sure that everything gets done correctly, but they are doing the process themselves entirely. How does it seem like that affects them? Oh, they love it. Uh, anytime that it's Tower Garden Planting Day, I, I have 10, 15 students come up to me, uh, Mr. Slaughter, can I use my recess to help you with the Tower Gardens today? They're willing to give up their recess time to help with the Tower Gardens. My biggest takeaway, I would say, is there always needs to be more people involved, and our our society has gotten so far disconnected from where their food comes from that if we can begin with the students, start with children, teaching them how to grow food, they will be much more interested in where their food comes from as they get older. And I, th I think that's a very important part of the process. That actually just brings up a question that I had when you first told me that there was this choice program and that ag was one of the, the choices that students are applying for and hoping to get chosen and that sort of thing. And I think in my own mind, I'm like, how many kids are really going to be interested in agriculture? But then when I'm here, I'm seeing how much fun it is. And especially seeing the kitchens and seeing that there's that cooking is so much a part of it. I just know that kids usually love to cook and they love to be outside and with animals and stuff. But I think when you say just the word agriculture, it may not necessarily sound that exciting, but, but then when you see what it involves. Exactly. Exactly. And, and we've last summer gave the students the chance to have what we were calling the, an experience, which we'll have in a couple weeks from now as well. So second graders from five different elementary schools are going to get bussed here to see what it looks like during the day. Okay. They'll get the opportunity to plant some seeds. We're going to walk down to Pinnegar Arena and they're going to be able to pet a horse. And we'll have the Hillcrest High School FFA students bring over some some sheep and some goats that the students will be able to kind of interact with. So they'll get to see all the really fun and exciting aspects of agriculture. And hopefully that will motivate even more students to want to apply and want to come here. Mm -hmm. But I would say on average, I, I don't know exactly the numbers, but uh, I would say it's a couple hundred students apply for the choice programs annually. Okay. Yeah. So once they see sort of what it looks like, they're like, ooh, I think I want to do that. <laughs> exactly. You're telling me I get to learn how to make crepes at school? Yeah, yeah I want to do that. <laughs> Could you say just a few things about why or how the cooking part is integrated into the ag program? Sure, yeah. We mentioned the tower garden lettuce that they get to use and those raised beds in the greenhouse that are currently growing produce. So right. that produce will come out and get added to a recipe that they make in the future. Maybe we'll add the cucumbers onto a salad or maybe we'll just do a taste test with them separately. Mm -hmm. We also did a field trip to Hy-Vee where we had their dietitian show us around each section of Hy-Vee. And then we gave them a scavenger hunt of trying to find all these different foods in the building and you have to write down what aisle that they were found on. And then they, they purchased ingredients for their pizzas and they brought that back to the Ag Academy, and then they assembled their pizzas, and we had our, our pizza competition. Yeah. just sounds like it's, a, it's more kind of a holistic kind of food and farming program or a food studies program where you're learning how, how things are made. And then, exactly. like you said, the, the roots, shoots, and... Fruits. Fruits. <laughs> yeah, that, that's understanding the different parts of the plants, and on different plants we eat different parts, and yeah. Yes, exactly. So it's, it's all a part of the process, and, and seeing from seed to harvest, quite literally, the entire process. So we try to encourage the students to be as adventurous as possible here. A phrase that I learned from one of the conferences I went to that I'm instilling deeply in these children is that we do not yuck someone else's yum. And by that, I mean, if you like what we just tried, hey, that's great. If you don't like it, that's totally fine too. What's not okay is for you to go, Ooh, Kate, you liked that? That's so gross. We're not making people feel bad about what they taste if they like it. 
it's okay to like something and it's okay to not like something. And I think that's a very, very important part of the process. Mm -hmm. So we try to give them the opportunity to try a lot of different things that they might not otherwise. We did a roots, shoots, and fruits lesson. And a part of that lesson was them getting to taste I think we had six different types of radishes and a couple different types of carrots and a couple different types of turnips. So the students got the chance to try all these different things and then kind of rate it yes or no if you like it or you don't like it. We grow a tree in our an, an annual tropical tree in our greenhouse that's called Moringa that's one of the most nutrient dense greens and the students really love getting to taste that. We had a family night several months ago where the students were able to give their parents a tour of the building and they would go through the greenhouse. And my understanding was that the majority of them that brought their parents through the greenhouse were like, you have to try Mr. Slaughter's tree. And the parents were, what? And some of the parents are a little bit weary and, and maybe even yucking their kids yum. And then the, I heard the kids would set them straight and say, don't make fun of me for liking this. And so the, the, it's, it's getting through to them. Well, this is great. Thank you so much uh, for talking with me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. That was Kendall Slaughter, the Farm to School Coordinator for the Springfield Public Schools in Southern Missouri. You can learn more about their programs on our website, eartheats.org. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Earth Eats team includes Violet Barron, Aya Bonbinder, Alex Chambers, Mark Chilla, Toby Foster, Daniela Richardson, Samantha Schemenauer, Peyton Whaley, and Harvest Public Media. Special thanks this week to Justine Lines, Kendall Slaughter, and everyone at the Ag Academy. The show is produced and edited by me, Kate Young. Our theme music is composed by Aaron Toby and performed by Aaron and Matt Toby. Additional music on the show comes to us from Universal Production Music. Our executive producer is John Bailey. Mm-hmm.